When each of you were born, there were roughly 7,000 languages spoken on earth. Now, a language isn't just a body of vocabulary or a set of grammatical structures. A language is a flash of the human spirit. It's a vehicle through which the soul of each particular culture reaches into the material world. Every language is an old-growth forest of the mind, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of social, spiritual possibilities. And of those 7,000 languages spoken the day you were born by absolute academic consensus, we know that half are not being whispered into the ears of infants, which means they're essentially on the road to extinction. And there are many people, particularly in America, who say, well, wouldn't the world be a better place if we all spoke one language? Wouldn't communication be facilitated? Wouldn't it be you know, easier for us to get along? And my answer to that is always to say, what a brilliant idea. But let's make that universal language a Nupatak. Let's make it Yoruba. Let's make it Quechua. Let's make it Tibetan. And suddenly you begin to feel, as a native speaker of English, what it would be like to be enveloped in silence, to have no means or ability to pass on the wisdom of your ancestry or to anticipate the promise of your descendants. And yet that dreadful plight is indeed the fate of somebody somewhere on earth every fortnight. Because on average, every two weeks, some elder passes away and carries with him or her into the grave the last syllables of an ancient tongue. And the reason this is so particularly poignant is that it's occurring within the same generation in which geneticists, in all of their brilliance, have proven it to be true, something that philosophers have always hoped to be true, and that is the fact that we're all brothers and sisters. And I don't mean that in the spirit of hippie ethnography. I mean, quite literally, studies of the human genome have left no doubt whatsoever that the genetic endowment of humanity is a continuum. Race has been exposed as an utter fiction. We are all cut from the same genetic cloth. Indeed, we're all descendants of that same handful of hominids who walked out of Africa some 65,000 years ago and then embarked on this extraordinary hegira, a diaspora 2,500 generations in duration, 40,000 years that carried the human spirit to every corner of the habitable world. But here's the important revelation. If we all share the same raw genetic endowment, by definition, every human population shares the same raw human genius, the same mental acuity, the same human potential. And critically, whether that genius is invested in technological wizardry, which has been the great achievement in the West, or placed instead into the complex task of unraveling the mystic threads of memory inherent in a myth is simply a matter of choice and cultural orientation. There is no hierarchy in the affairs of culture. That old Victorian idea that we somehow went from the savage to the barbarian to the civilized of the Strand of London has been utterly ridiculed by modern science and shown to be as much of a colonial conceit, as was the notion of clergymen in the 19th century that the earth was only 6,000 years old, as irrelevant to our lives today as that notion. And what this means fundamentally, of course, is that the other peoples of the world aren't failed attempts at being you. They're not failed attempts at being modern. Every culture, by definition, is a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the peoples of the world answer that question, they do so in the 7,000 different voices of humanity. And those answers, collectively, like those voices, become our human repertoire for dealing with the challenges that will confront us in the coming millennia. But the question becomes, what do you do about it? You know, if you're a biologist and you identify an area of high species endemism, you seek to create a protected area, but you can't make a rainforest park of the mind. You can't freeze people in time like some kind of zoological specimen. Change, after all, is a constant in human affairs. No anthropologist ever speaks about preserving culture. It makes no sense whatsoever. Anthropologists are simply concerned about maintaining 
the diversity of the human spirit as brought into being by culture. Ruth Benedict, the great student of Franz Boas, said the entire purpose of anthropology is to make the world safe for human differences, which is why cultural anthropology is the antidote to Trump. 